Hello everyone, how's it going and welcome to my personal top 10 games of 2017 list. Spoiler free. Now do bear in mind, there will be some games conspicuous by their absence, which I'm sure, had I got around to actually playing them this year, they'd probably have made the cut. And those, in no particular order, are Persona 5, Divinity Original Sin 2, Assassin's Creed Origins, Hand in Time, Prey, and Breath of the Wild. Since I'm only about halfway through Breath of the Wild, and only games I finished are eligible to make this list, so again, if I didn't play it, it simply cannot make the list. I am but one man. One glorious, glorious man, but still one man. Oh, and also note that DLC will not be included unless it's a huge game-sized expansion. That might be a clue as to something coming up on the list. Now, without further ado, number 10. Middle-earth Shadow of War. Oh, Shadow of War. I want to love you so much more than I do. This comes right in at the bottom of my personal list due to two glaring issues I had with the game. Though despite those, I cannot deny... For the most part, it was a very fun, albeit shallow and repetitive experience. So let's get the negatives out of the way and then I'll tell you why despite those, it's still an enjoyable game to me. First of all, the obvious loot box controversy put a nasty taste in my mouth before I even loaded up the game. So that wasn't a great start. I won't go into the fire details, but suffice to say, the true ending requires a lot of grinding. I'm talking 20 or more hours worth on top of what you already did to play the game or buying a ton of the microtransaction loot boxes. Personally, I got very bored of the grind very quickly and simply looked up the true ending on YouTube. I don't regret it. My second biggest gripe with the game is how lazy the quests are. It's almost always kill orcs. And don't misunderstand me. I like kicking orcs heads in with my half ghost, half undead, half elf, half human, body sharing thing known as Talion as much as the next man, but by God, it would have been nice to have a few more quests with unique creatures or boss fights instead of orcs, orcs, or more orcs. It was like a goddamn orc lemon party by the end of the game. All naked and sucking each other's d- Onto why it actually made the list. It's fun. Oh, you wanted more than that. Well, it's fun because of the nemesis system. At one point, I cleaved an orc clean in two, and I said aloud, he ain't coming back. Oh, but he came back. He came back part machine riding a dire character swearing revenge upon me with a deeper voice and everything. It was... Genuinely cool as hell. Another orc I recruited, then unbeknownst to me, I attacked his blood brother, which snapped him out of his trance to defend his sworn orc brother from another mother. What do I think of it? Do orcs have mothers? Actually, are there even female orcs? Maybe that's why they're all so pissed off all the time, because there's just no women around. Anyway, the point is, I then killed his blood brother and attempted to re-recruit him, only for him to have this Iron Will ability that stops him from being recruited again. So I shamed him, which lowers his level, sends him away, you get a chance of the Iron Will ability disappearing. The long story short version, if I cut to the chase, is that basically I kept shaming him time after time and then trying to recruit him, and time after time he kept having the Iron Will ability. I did it so much that I ended up melting his brain. He quite literally lost the ability to speak, so the next time I saw him, he just made weird noises. It was quite depressing, and then because he was so weak from me lowering his level so much, I accidentally one-shot him. And then he came back from the dead, and I was super excited, and then I accidentally one-shot him again. So I never did get him back. I just wanted him on my side as my bodyguard, just going, arr, arr. But no, he was, he was gone forever. So, those are two examples of why the Nemesis system is so good and why it makes the game so fun and interesting to play so that's why despite its flaws it still made the list you just made the list okay so number nine south park the fractured butthole ha 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 it's a pun i'm going to attempt to keep this one short since i rambled on about shadow of war and frankly it's hard to talk too much about it and um, why i wasn't so hot in it without spoiling things so let's start once again with the negatives i didn't think it was as funny as stick of truth the story at no point really felt engaging, it just felt like there was no clear goal, no villain, and nothing too important going on for about three quarters of the game. And the ending was actually atrocious. Genuinely really bad. So the positives, despite being to my taste not as funny as Stick of Truth, it still had a good amount of laugh out loud moments, one in particular involving some Mexicans that you'll know when you see it I found genuinely hilarious. The combat is also much improved over the original, but only two or three fights in the game actually made me have to think about how to tactically take care of them, because for the most part, as long as you just avoid the AoEs, you're going to be fine. Though still, overall a very enjoyable game, though I felt it was a little too long, kind of dragged for me, and never engaged me in the story at all, to be honest. It never felt like there was anything at stake, unfortunately. 
Number eight, Dead Cells. Okay, this one is still in early access, but despite that, it's very fun to play. And hey, if you're charging money for something, then it's eligible for the list, in my opinion. And hey, it's my list. By me. Dead Cells is a hack and slash roguelike or roguelite metroidvania style game with dodge rolling, randomized pickups, and randomized levels. And the combat is extremely fluid and fun to play. There's a good amount of variation between the weapons and pickups that I didn't get bored despite it being permadeath and me dying a good few times early on. As of the last time I played the game, there were only two bosses in it. I believe they said when it's finished, there's going to be at least four, so it doesn't rank higher on my list because it's essentially half finished or thereabouts. But despite that, a very fun and solid game that I got a great amount of enjoyment from, and I can't wait to play it again when it's actually complete. Number seven. The Morrowind expansion for Elder Scrolls Online. Okay. So, I understand it's an expansion, it's not a game on its own, but it's my list, and it took me like 30 plus hours to beat, so... I'm going to consider it essentially like a game, so again, fight me. So let's start out with my Elder Scrolls background to give you some perspective here. My first Elder Scrolls game was Oblivion, which I played on PlayStation 3 in around 2009 or 2010, a few years after it came out originally, but I went to mod it, and it was actually the first PC game that I ever played modded. Played it, finished it, loved it, played Skyrim, finished it, liked it, but not as much as Oblivion. Only a couple of years ago now, I played Morrowind for the very first time. I love all three, but good lord, Morrowind has some old game jank to it. So suffice to say, I was excited to see how they reimagined the province of Morrowind in Elder Scrolls Online, or at least a pre-Elder Scrolls 3 version of it. So, once again, let's start out with the negatives here. There's a couple of glaring issues with this one for me, the biggest one being that the thing I enjoy the most in an Elder Scrolls game is the looting, or at least one of the things I enjoy the most. Finding new interesting or powerful loot, or hell in the arm to steal that ball in silver vase that that rich dark elf bastard down the street has in his nightstand. If those are two things you love, then you should expect to be disappointed by these aspects of Elder Scrolls Online's Morrowind expansion. You can steal almost nothing. Most objects in the world are static and can't be touched at all, and dungeons, caves, etc. have very little loots. Generally, there will be some coffers in there that you can get some kind of crappy booty out of, but really nothing of worth. To give you another example, I killed a world boss. A world boss is, what well, you might expect, is a boss that pops up in the world, usually designed for multiple people to take it out, but I killed a few of them on my own. And after a, I think several minutes just of hacking away at this thing, because again, it was designed for multiple people, it dropped a few janky items, nothing too interesting, and literally four gold. To put that in perspective for you, I killed a trash mob that dropped 10 gold, around about the same level. So it wasn't that, you know, I leveled up and then trash mobs started dropping more than bosses. No, no, no. It's just one of those things with the loot in this game that even a boss will drop you just 4 gold, a complete pittance that you can get more of from killing like a mug crab. It doesn't make any sense. So why did I like it so much? That's an easy one to answer. The quests. Most quests had interesting dialogue, especially from a lore perspective, a decent amount of memorable characters and weren't super repetitive. One quest, minor spoilers here, it's a side quest, just skip ahead 30 seconds if you don't want to hear any spoilers about it whatsoever. You have been warned. I was asked to search in a mine and discover why miners were going missing. Who were mining this rare ore in there? I think it was ebony or something like that. It turns out, they were the ore. They were being turned into the ore. There's a whole lot more to that quest, but I'm not going to go into it. But that's just one small example of a random side quest that I found that had a super cool twist to it. And again, the dialogue I feel like is genuinely better written than most of the dialogue in Skyrim, though that's probably not really saying that much. Overall, really fun game, or expansion, whatever you want to call it. Highly recommend it, especially if you already have Elder Scrolls Online. Hell, I recommend it even if you don't. You can pick it up very cheap. Play through that, have your fun with it. If you still don't think Elder Scrolls Online is for you, then just don't play any more of it. Number six, Resident Evil 7. Good lord, what a turnaround, holy crap. Resident Evil 6 was the biggest pile of shit of a game and along comes 7. With a first person camera, it's an actual horror game instead of a really crappy Call of Duty action clone garbage fire, like 6 was. Did I mention 6 is bad? Negatives? Yeah, it's got those two. It became a little too action heavy and not really enough horror about halfway through the game, maybe sort of two thirds around there, and it felt obviously rushed towards the end, like picking up the grenade launcher literally 20 minutes before the end of the game. Overall though, very fun to play, especially the first half, and I like how it actually ties into Resident Evil despite being essentially a reboot, but it's still a sequel thing. And though it didn't scare me personally, because I'm one of those people, it just I wish I, I genuinely, this isn't me boasting, I wish I could be scared by video games and movies and things like that, I just, it doesn't work. I laughed out loud when the kid hit his head on the sign at the beginning of it. 
You know what I'm talking about. You know the part. Charlie's like, do 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 do, bang. Laughter. I was the only person in the theater that laughed when it happened. I felt like a monster. But yeah, anyway, the point being, a true return of form for the series, finally. Thank you, Capcom. Don't fuck up number eight. Number five. Mario Odyssey. Boo! Boo! Roger and Solo! Boo! Boo! You suck, I hate you, boo! Okay, okay, okay. Hear me out here, please. It's number five that isn't low on the list, and I do really like this game. As someone who has never played Galaxy or even Mario 64, yes, I know that makes me a heathen bastard. What do you want from me? I was a poor kid. But I did play Wonder 3 and World to Death as a kid. I think this game's great. I just didn't enjoy it as much as the other four above it on the list, quite clearly. The only thing that lets it down in my opinion, and it really is only one thing, but it's a big deal to me personally, is a lack of challenge. And I'm someone who by my own admission frankly sucks at platformers, at least usually. The odd one comes along where I seem to be decent at it, but generally I'm not that great at them. I enjoy them, but I'm not very good at them. So if I think it's too easy, then it's probably a little too easy. Having said that, there are some tough sections, don't get me wrong, though usually they're optional ones sort of after you've beaten the game, but just too few for my personal liking. However, overall I thought this game was thoroughly enjoyable, extremely well made, colorful, bright, beautiful, fun to play, and brought me back to the days of games like Spyro 3 and the like. The whole concept is to collect moons. Moons power up your airship, the Odyssey, which is what the game's named after, spoilers. When you acquire enough of them, you can also then spend them on costumes, and good lord does this game have a ton of costumes. Everything from Dry Bones to Waluigi and Wario, and even... 64-bit Mario from Mario 64. Not that I would know that, of course, because I haven't played that game. I highly, highly recommend this, and if you have a Switch, do not delay buying the game. Even though Nintendo steals all of my ad revenue, I'm still giving you free advertising, Nintendo. You are welcome, you ungrateful bastards. It's a complete joy to play. Play it, trust me. Okay. So we're getting down to the final four here. I'd like to point out it was extremely difficult for me to pick between my top four. Any of these could have shifted places on a different day, quite honestly. So, without further ado, number four, Cuphead. Holy crap, this game is beautiful in the most unique way. A game that looks like a 1930s cartoon to the T, and even the music sounds perfectly 1930s, so even if the gameplay had been mediocre, it would have still been a visual and audio masterpiece, in my opinion. But it's actually it's a fun to play as well. Tight controls, fun platforming, run and gun levels, and tons of uniquely designed bosses that all fight differently and animate beautifully the entire time. I have almost nothing I can criticize when it comes to this game, except I'd have liked to have seen more of the run and gun levels because I personally really enjoy them. Despite the fact I heard a few people saying that they felt tacked on and not as fun as the bosses, personally I found them a nice change of pace and I hope for more of them in the sequel, which I think has been confirmed to be coming, but don't ask me when. I'm sure even the developers do not know. Either way, I'm looking forward to a Cuphead 2 if such a thing exists or Maybe even some DLC. Give me more Cuphead, god damn it. Number three. Horizon Zero Dawn. Weird name. Not really a memorable name, but a very memorable game. Yes, that rhymes. It wasn't meant to. First of all, this is hands down the most beautiful game I've seen on a console, and I'm not just saying that. And it's easily up there with the most beautiful PC games I've ever seen as well, and my PC is no slouch. And at several points during the game, I was visually wowed by how good it looked. I'm not kidding. It looks real good. I found the lore of the world and the machines to be super interesting, and moreover, I thoroughly enjoyed the combat. Taking down a Thunderjaw for me in this game is one of the coolest feelings I've had in a video game in a very long time. The first time I killed a Thunderjaw, I don't think I'm going to forget that anytime soon. For me, the story and pacing, however, fell flat towards the end of the game. Uh, there were audio and text logs kind of one after another, and it felt like I was just standing around reading and listening to them for literally hours. I think at one point for about two hours I was just going over audio and text logs. It was getting a little much. Overall though, I love this game to death and I'm looking forward to getting around to playing the DLC, which yes, I still haven't tried yet. We're gonna say it's been a busy year for video games. Number two, Neo. Neo is without a doubt in many ways a shameless Dark Souls clone. The bloodstain mechanic, the currency mechanic, the dodge eye frames along with enemies hitting you for anything from one third of your HP bar to your entire HP bar in a single hit and much more. But with all that stripped away, it's still a very fun game that actually does a few of its own things. For example, Feudal Japan with demons, pretty cool. The option of a low, medium, and high stance in combat that have speed and power trade-offs, as well as the Guardian Spirits, the crafting mechanics, the Diablo-esque loot system, and mission-based levels, to just name a few differences 
from Dark Souls. Overall, most importantly, I simply had a ton of fun once I got used to the combat system. It was extremely satisfying dodging and cutting down enemies and slaying the bosses. My only real gripe is there is a ton of copy pasting when it comes to side areas. However, I personally ignored most of these and still spent a good 30 to 40 hours getting through most of the main content despite not dying too much. Bottom line is Neo is a shit ton of fun. And that's overall the biggest, most important criteria here. If I had the most fun with it, it's probably going to be near the top of the list. Speaking of the top of the list, number one, Hollow Knights. Hollow Knight is a game that I feel like most people just didn't play this year. I listened to so many podcasts and looked at different top 10 lists. Hollow Knight wasn't even mentioned by most of these people, which is a shame because... It's a really good game, in case you couldn't tell. Hollow Knight is a side-scrolling metrovania where you play as a little nameless bug dude and for a while you're not even sure what's happening in the story. You wander the world killing bosses, gaining new powers like double jump, wall jump, and essentially flights. At least in a straight line anyway. A visually beautiful game with a ton of content, a good level of challenge and overall quality that few games I played this year came close to quite frankly. I will say though that the free DLC that they have released for this game this year somewhat dampens my experience for it overall because it's generally just a bunch of boss hard boss fights that border more on annoying than challengingly fun however that is optional and again it was free post release content so I'm not going to judge the game on that. The base game is a thoroughly rewarding, always interesting, unique, challenging, and fun game to play, and I highly recommend it to anyone who even has a passing interest in Metroidvanias. Please, if you do nothing else from this video, check out Hollow Knight, Neo. Check out all of them. Just, just check, just check out. Check out all ten. But overall, Hollow Knight and Neo. For Christ's sakes, try those two, even if you can't try the other ones. They're both on PC. Neo is on PlayStation 4, Hollow Knight, I don't know if it's on anything but PC, but Christ's sakes, man, please just try them. You will enjoy them, probably. I can't guarantee anything. Anyway, so that was my personal top 10 list of 2017. Like I said, I have not finished Breath of the Wild yet, so that is why I did not make the cut. I'm sure I will love Persona 5, Divinity Original Sin 2, maybe Assassin's Creed. A Hat in Time looks amazing. Prey, it looks like a ton of fun. I just bought that, so I'm going to get around to playing that eventually. But yeah, point is, out of the games that I did play, that was my top 10. Thank you everybody for watching, I do hope you enjoyed it, and thank you especially to this month's $10 plus tier patrons who are as follows. Don Lobo, I'll be jiggered, Joey, Billy Nying, Dr. Papa Penguin, Nuria Age, Bad Beauty, Bebop56210, Grandpa Gus, Source of Success, and Hitbox. And of course, thank you to this month's $5 plus tier patrons as well, who should be on the screen at any moment, alongside this month's Twitch subscribers. And thank you to everybody in the lower tier as well. If you would like to become a patron yourself, you can do so over at patreon.com slash LP, which should be linked in the video description, along with my Twitter and my Twitch, if you should wish to watch this live, if you're not already. Anyway, most importantly, just thank you for watching. I could not do this without you guys. You guys... You're awesome. Good night, everybody, and good morning.